Hi everyone, this is Sarah O'Keefe. Welcome to our To Dita or Not To Dita webcast with a shameless, uh, I guess, Shakespearean epic sort of twist on things. I'm here with Alyssa Fox and Tony Mantich, and they are going to talk about their different decisions in terms of what they did with Dita or not, as the case may be. So, for those of you that don't know me, the, you know, I don't know, three of you on the call. Oh, sorry, one other thing. Uh, a couple of housekeeping notes. So everyone except for the three of us are muted. Um, so Alyssa and Tony and I get to talk. And um, everyone else, if you can ask your questions either through the questions area in the webcast interface or in the chat area, we will pick those up from there. Uh, we are recording the presentation, but the attendees do not appear in the recording. All right, so there I am. Uh, I run Scriptorium Publishing here based in North Carolina. Uh, I have to point out that we just got our Content Strategy 101 book out because that's been an eight, nine month epic, painful kind of thing. And my particular interest is this sort of collision of content and technology and publishing. That's where I spend most of my time. Uh, Alyssa, are you there, Alyssa? I'm here. Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, to to introduce myself, I'm a Senior Manager of Information Development at NetIQ, which is an enterprise software company. I'm a Secretary for the Society for Technical Communication, and I uh, did the program for the 2012 STC Summit. I have about 15 years of experience in TechCom, and I'm really interested in usability, targeted documentation, and agile practices. And you're based in Houston, um, so we've got yes. a central time zone. And then we've got our early bird. Tony, you there? I am. Uh, good morning. It's uh, a little after 8 here in Portland, Oregon, where I work from my home. I work for Automatic Data Processing, or ADP, where my uh, title is Information Architect. Um, right now, the reason I'm here is we're in the middle of a, a multi-year effort to move to DITA and, and also eventually to a content management system. Uh, we also are simultaneously moving to a uh, translation solution. So we've got a lot of things going on. Um, I should mention, uh, I want to mention up front that this is kind of an in media res presentation for us because we are just in the uh, POC going into pilot, but we are pretty committed to, to moving to DITA. So I've been writing uh, professionally for a long time. I've been in TechCom for about 10 years. And uh, in addition to working at ADP, I um, teach uh, technical communication courses pretty regularly in the uh, graduate program at Portland State University. OK, well, thank you both for agreeing to do this. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what our agenda here is going to look like. Um, Tony is going to be in the DITA corner and Alyssa in the not DITA corner. And what we want to do is talk a little bit about why they've chosen what they've chosen or why their organizations have chosen the path they have, the advantages and disadvantages, the factors that went into this and a section about, you know, issues, challenges. I'm afraid I called it mistakes were made, but I think I've changed the slide. So with that, Tony, I'm going to turn it over to you so that you can talk a little bit about why you did go to DITA or why you decided on that direction. Okay. Um, as I mentioned or, or the slide mentioned, um, we're a pretty large group. We have over 60 writers. Um, and some of the key drivers for us were um, were mostly that we were drowning. Um, we support probably, I don't know, well over 20 different products um, or offerings. And then on top of that, many of our, of our biggest offerings are integrated solutions. So they contain um, parts of other offerings. So we have kind of a mix and match architecture um, and obviously with that, we have to create a lot of different combinations of material, um, but a lot of that material should be or, or could be uh, single source. Um, and since that's our main architecture and sales model, um, there's really a lot of potential for reuse. Um, we, I should also mention, just for those of you who are interested, we um, currently or previously were primarily a RoboHelp shop. Um, we do, uh, for our PDFs, we use FrameMaker. We have some some projects using author it, uh, offer it, but but not a big usage there. Um, so th those were our main. Um, I, I think our main driver was really needing to 
create a, a lot of different outputs using the same material. So, so really being able to streamline our, uh, our reuse. And then um, translation, um, we're, we're gradually moving into more and more languages. And so having a structured and standards-based uh, format was really important to us to kind of help with the translation management. Okay, so pretty standard kind of list of issues, you know. When, when we did our survey a couple of years ago, reuse was number one and localization, I think, was number two. Those are basically the things that drive people over to DITA. So, Alyssa, what about you? You made well, a different decision. Right, and as you mentioned, the, the reuse and the localization are the big uh, reasons for moving over, and the reason we the main reasons we chose not to move to DITA were the same things. We didn't have a lot of reuse. We initially thought that there would be quite a bit more reuse of our material, not only within our information development department, but also among our marketing, training, and a tech support departments as well, and that just didn't end up happening. So um, we didn't have enough reuse to really justify uh, the cost it would take for us to move over. Um, we also didn't have any localization at our company until recently. We recently merged with another company last year, and we are getting more into localization now, um, but we still don't have um, the, the value add that we would need because we do have an in-house system that we use, another XML-based system for our localization process. Um, the upfront cost that it was going to take for us to migrate all of our content, we have quite a bit of legacy content, um, it was just prohibitive for what we would get out of making the switch. So those were our main reasons for sticking with a, a not DITA approach. <laughs> a not DITA approach. Mm. So, so Tony, back to you, what, what do you think is the biggest advantage that you see or that you expect to see? Well, I, I tried to break, down, break this down to one, and, and I didn't quite make it. I got it down to two, though, which is pretty close. Um, <laughs> some of our, our biggest, I think, hopes for gains are, uh, one, clearly around efficiency, which is really an argument about ROI, um, because we have lots of potential for reuse. Um, we expect um, after we get through implementation to have you know substantial savings in terms of authoring time, certainly publishing time. Right now, our publishing processes are are very uh, complicated, um, so you know a lot of time and money saving there. Um, and and that's not only in terms of you know writing the content once and reusing it multiple places, but also that separation of um, content from form. Right, so our writers really can spend more time. Um, on writing and not formatting. Um, just this week, in fact, I got um, some feedback from a team that's really frustrated with the amount of time they're spending having to tweak things to get them just right in the uh, final output. And then, of course, another uh, big efficiency ROI game for us will be around translation. The other really important thing for us is, is flexibility, which um, I know sometimes people think, oh, structured offering, we're going to have less flexibility. But um, actually, because it's standards-based, um, because we're using consistent content elements and a, and a structure, and because we can do um, really rich and robust semantic metadata, it's going to uh, allow us to support all of our very um, complicated and, and multifarious combinations of, of content that we need to create. Um, and in fact, we're even hoping at some point to be able to publish things dynamically according to a whole list of parameters um, that make content really specific to a specific user. Um, and then also because it's structured and, and standards-based, right, based on XML instead of, say, HTML with some proprietary stuff in there, um, it makes it much more easily consumable by other systems, right? So we use um, a specific search um, mechanism within our products, and we, in, order, in order to interface with that, we um, having the XML with the metadata in it uh, really helps us. Uh, it also helps it be more integrated with our application. So again, having that XML basis and then the, the clear, robust, and, and fairly stable architecture uh, really allow us to be much more flexible. And it even um, it gives us a little bit of future proofing because we can also be flexible about the many types of media and output we create. And that includes being able to transform to um, outputs we might not even know that we need yet. Right? So certainly we're going to have, for example, more mobile outputs um, in the future. And since we're starting with XML, it's going to be a lot easier to, to manage that. 
Okay, so um, Alyssa, on your end, what's, what's your biggest advantage? And also, while we're at it, I don't think we actually specified what not did meant in your case. If you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about the approach that you did choose. Okay. Uh, we're actually in a, in a transition phase right now. Previously, we were using Unstructured FrameMaker and um, converting it uh, to online help using Flare and um, using Acrobat for PDFs. Um, we're currently switching over to Structured FrameMaker. We do not have a content management system, um, and we have an in-house process that we use for um, converting to XML uh, for our localization purposes, and then we use that same process to um, output PDF and HTML. So uh, we don't have the content management system. We don't have the uh, data structuring um, like Tony is working on. Um, and that, that's kind of what I mean by not data. It's, it's not only not data, it's not content management either, but we are moving towards the structured frame. So as far as the adva biggest advantage goes of not using data, um, I kind of struggled with this a little bit because I think data is a, a really good um, format or process or system, structure or system if, if you need it. Um, I wouldn't really say that there's an advantage of not using it other than um, the biggest thing we found is just having the freedom to structure our docs the way we want them to and having a little more control over the look and feel of the way our documentation is output, outputted, whatever the proper word is there. <laughs> I'm not really sure what the past tense is. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, so, but what would be the biggest advantage of the, you know, the system you did choose, you know, the, yeah, away this from is the, the negative? Right. Um, so we do have that flexibility there. Um, the, the structured frame is nice in that um, we have a little more uh, consistency with the way that we write, but um, having the ability to do different things among our documentation sets from product to product, for example, or we have different kinds of documentation based on um, whether it's core documentation, for example, for a core product or modules, that sort of thing. It's nice to have a little bit of flexibility there. Um, to work work with that outside of that structure. Okay, and you and you mentioned the cost of migration was just yes, the cost of, of migration cost. was yeah with the legacy documentation that we have and what it was going to cost us to make that migration and how much time and money that would take away from us working on project work every day. Our, our department's fairly small for the amount of products that we put out. Um, that it, There was just no way we could do that without significantly impacting project deadlines, and there weren't a lot of people that were on board with that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. So from there, you know, having talked about the biggest advantage, the, you know, the clear next question is what's the biggest disadvantage? or the biggest challenge? What, what are you running into, Tony? Well, I, I remember when I very first started hearing about DITA, and it was probably at an SCC conference eight or nine years ago, where the Amber Swope and, and Michael Priestley and Andrea Ames were all still with IBM, and I watched a lot of really blue slideshows about DITA. <laughs> and the thing they kept saying was, you know, you have to prepare for this, right? And that. Um, and they were talking about um, culture, right? You have to prepare your writers, and you also have to prepare the organization. And and I think that really has been a big challenge. Um, you know, just thinking in terms of the writers, um, they have to deal with a new structure and a new structure that's technologically enforced, right? That's something we're not really used to. Um, they have to deal with a new markup language in XML, and with that comes new tools. And they have to deal with a new writing style, right? Because we moved to uh, minimalism and, and topic-based writing. So um, I, I do think that that's one of our biggest challenges. We did do some things to, to try to address that. Um, and, and one of the things we did is that we tried to separate um, moving to the data content types and to minimalism uh, makes that temporally distinct from moving to a new tool. And the way we did that is we created a, uh, we did some minimalism training before we even moved anything, and some topic-based authoring training. And then we also implemented what I call a transitional or fake data architecture in RoboHelp. So basically we um, mimicked the three content types, uh, content, uh, concept, task, and reference. Um, we created templates for them, and then we basically used RoboHelp styles um, 
as equivalents for what will be the XML content elements. And so the writers um, had to kind of make that transition to those new uh, content types and start using those, those styles, which are, uh, map pretty well to the content elements. And I think this has helped the writers get a little bit used to that. You know, it hasn't been easy. We've still got some, some learning to do there. Um, but, it, but I think it's, you know, at least when we do make the jump, we won't be starting from square one. The other thing that did, um, I'm told by our consultant, um, is that it helped with the conversion process a little bit because it was easier. Um, we had already done a lot of the rewriting that's involved um, before you can really, um, you know, we had reworked our content so it was in much better shape to move to these, um, to the real data structure. Um, again, it's not perfect um, for a lot of reasons, um, not least of which is because Verbal Health is an HTML-based tool, and so we're still struggling with, um, you know, some of the style issues and those kinds of things. But I do think it helped, kind of, um, help us to take smaller steps in that that culture change. Yeah, and, and you know, I chose a, an extreme sports kind of theme for this webcast, um, and and I'm afraid this 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 picture is actually really apt. You know, you're saying basically preparation and organizing is the key. You know, to me, in terms of skydiving, the key would be that I would refuse to get on the plane. So <laughs> it's sort of you must prepare. Um, Alyssa, on your end, in the transition that you've made, what does that look like? What were your challenges? Another thing I'm not a big fan of here. Well, <laughs> one of our biggest challenges, I think, um, in our unstructured frame paradigm was thinking about books all the time. And, and we still struggle that, with this. You know, how does this fit into a book? What is our book going to look like? And I think one of my biggest regrets is not moving to structured content earlier. And now that we are moving over to the, to the structured frame, you know, people are thinking about what they're presenting a little differently. They're not always thinking about the books. Um, you know, when it's topic-based, they're thinking more about the information itself and the best way to present it. Um, and then you can reuse those topics in the multiple outputs and deliverables and formats. And I've, I've seen, start to, started to see, you know, people think differently about how the best way to present this information and not just thinking about what book do I need, what book do I need. Um, I think we need to move away from all of the PDFs and to have more online uh, context-sensitive information when and where the users need it. And I, and I have started to see that mind switch as we've moved over to the structured content. So I wish we would have done that sooner. Also, the consistency factor that I mentioned earlier um, in the formatting and the, the way that people are writing is really good because obviously anytime you have more than one writer in an organization, you want your, all of your information to sound like it's coming from the same general person or area, not 50 different writers uh, writing 50 different ways. So our writers do move across multiple projects um, fairly often, uh, unfortunately. I wish it wasn't that way, but we do have them working on multiple things, so it's nice to have a little bit more consistency so things do look like they come all from one person in that regard. Okay. And I have a question here that I want to kind of throw in and maybe let you tackle and then also have uh, Tony jump in on this. Um, the question is, and, and I think this is to you, Alyssa, how about leaving legacy content alone and just producing new information in DITA? They're already taking a portion of the step with structured XML. So in other words, if, if migration is the big stumbling block, then why not just, you know, not migrate? but do the new stuff in DITA. What, what, what's your thought on that? I like the, the theory of it. Um, uh, with a couple, I'm thinking of a couple of our documentation sets in particular, we have a problem where it's so gigantic that it's almost impossible to create new doc without ingraining it into the old doc um, in a way that would make sense for the user if that makes any sense. So basically what I'm trying to say is that um, we have to, in some certain situations on certain products that we have, we have to add information to old doc sets because that's where the customers are used to looking for them. For example, we have a product that's probably 16 or 17 years old that has a very large customer base. And um, if we started trying to put new information into, it, it, it would be like disparate doc sets to me. They would still have to deal with the old stuff, and then we'd have to add this new stuff, and it, it wouldn't go together. It doesn't seem like to me. Now, I could be wrong about that, but um, aside from that, you know, we don't have the, the reuse uh, needs 
for to use DITA in a way that would even make sense for us to even start using it, I don't believe at this point. That's not to say we wouldn't later, but I, I don't see an advantage for our group to start using it, you know, just to use it. Right, so the business case isn't there, or the business justification right. isn't there, even if you remove migration as an obstacle. Right. 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 Tony, did That's you right. want to jump in on that? Um, well, I, I think Alyssa really covered the, the key points. I, I guess the one thing I would just emphasize about um, the question about migration is even if you um, elect to go with data as we are, um, a, a lot of what we're doing a lot of content analysis now with our existing repertoire, and we won't migrate everything. Um, we have some things where um, the benefit of migrating will not be um, significant. Maybe it's a small project that doesn't have a lot of different uh, flavors or isn't going to be translated. Um, and so we really, uh, for each project, we'll weigh kind of the cost of migration and, and rewriting against things like um, the uh, deliverable output requirements, the language requirements, um, and even the kind of longevity of the project. You know, if we have some projects that we're not sure are going to be here in five years, you know, we're not sure we're going to migrate those over. So we're, we're definitely not going to migrate all of our legacy content. Okay. So the decision factors that we've kind of talked about in terms of what goes into this, you know, from a general point of view, for the people that are listening that are maybe trying to make the same decision, I think these are some of the things that we identified. Um, and let's see if we can just run these down. So Alyssa, your team size is uh, a couple dozen, right? Yeah, pretty close. 20, 25, and Tony, you're more like 60-ish, I think? Yeah, I mean, I should in, um, should clarify that that's the whole department. And again, not everybody's going to make this move immediately. Okay. Um, I do think, uh, you know, our hope is long-term that everybody will be on, on data for the vast majority of their projects. But, but yeah, and for our two big integrated products that, that we're targeting to start with, um, that probably takes I don't know, a third, maybe half of, of our writers. Okay, what about, um, Alyssa, what about deliverable requirements? Well, currently what we deliver is a PDF books and um, HTML online help uh, and sometimes context sensitive help. So, um, you know, which you can do with or without DITA systems, but um, it, it, I, I don't see how what we needed to deliver was necessarily um, a requirement to have the DITA system. Right. And Tony, on your end, I think you had a bit of a different situation. Yeah, we have, you know, in terms of media, we primarily support uh, web help or browser-based help and some PDF um, and increasingly mobile. Um, but we also have deliverable requirements to create all these different combinations of content. And that's where um, we were able to do some of that with the conditional publishing, you know, features in RoboHelp, but, but we, we really ended up with so many parameters, you know, different user roles and different languages and different product mixes and different feature sets um, that trying to support that with, with RoboHelp um, required generating, you know, pretty quickly um, more than a couple dozen separate outputs and had a really onerous publication. So, so it's not just about media requirements for us, it's also about content requir requirements. Um, and then also I mentioned earlier about having um, output that was easily consumable by other systems, um, which in our case means having, um, being able to just give them actually the XML as well that had metadata embedded in it. When we generate our output through RoboHelp, we can use the conditional build tags to generate output, but then when we give that output to somebody, it doesn't have any metadata in it. So um, a consuming system can't, for example, do its own kind of conditional publishing or conditional presentation or display. Um, so those are some of the requirements that, that really kind of pushed us, um, forced our hand almost um, to move the, to Yeah, and the, the extreme, you know, from my position as a consultant, the what we call extreme conditionals, or extreme, you know, conditional publishing, which is basically this issue of it's not just one or two conditionals, it's eight or ten or fifteen different kinds of conditions and all these combinations. That is an issue that very often pushes people into XML and DITA because they simply cannot support that with what I would describe as traditional 
conditional, build tag, you know, those, those kinds of things. Now, for localization, um, essentially, um, you know, I think, Tony, a major consideration for you and Alyssa, a, you know, zero and later not so, you know, not major consideration, right? Right. For for me, you know, I mentioned the in-house process that we use that actually does send it through XML, and that seems to be working pretty well with our localization group. Unless something significant changed in, in those requirements from them, I don't see us moving the data just for localization purposes. Right. Yeah, and okay. it, it was a big factor for us. Um, as I mentioned, we're also, we have a separate initiative going to um, to move to a translation management software you know, database-driven solution, and of course, having the XML source files will, will and, and the structure uh, will make that you know that much easier. So, um, you know, we're we're doing a handful of languages now, but we're adding we're adding languages all, all the time, and we're adding products that have localization requirements all the time. So, that's going to be a big um, area of ROI for us. For either of the two of you, did the skill sets of the current staff play into this at all? Was there any sort of decision process around, oh, there's a big learning curve or people don't want to change or anything like that? Or was that really a side issue? Well, it has been a major concern, um, you know. So I think when we were making our decision, you know, we, we you know, worked to show that it would be worth it, right, that it would be worth the learning curve, um, you know, as I mentioned. That, We've known from the beginning that that kind of culture, culture change, and and training were going to be were going to be big issues. And you know the the jury's still out on how well how well we're handling that. Um, but uh, you know well, maybe we'll do this again in a year, and you can ask me again. <laughs> how about you, Alyssa? Were the skill sets a consideration? It, it was, but it was more of a side issue because we didn't get far enough into thinking we were going to be heading down this path to really consider it. Um, anytime we do any kind of major change like this, obviously that's going to be a consideration. Um, and, and it was a bit of a concern, but um, we reevaluate probably every year or two um, on whether or not we want to use DITA, and um, that, that does come up. Um, but as Tony said, anytime you're going to do a significant change like this and have to uh, basically a culture change in the way you do things differently, I think that we're pretty confident we could tackle it if we needed to. We just have never gotten far enough down the path of saying, yes, we need to move to this, that it's been a huge concern. All right. So it's a secondary issue down the road, maybe. Right. Okay. And then I know clearly in your case, I mean, I, I have budget here, but really return on investment was the issue. You could probably get the budget if you could prove that it was worth it. Right. Yeah, that was definitely the situation with us. Um, it was going to be, as I mentioned, significant um, in terms of cost for, for making the change and um, not only to get the proper tools and the, and the time it would take to actually start with it, but the time it takes away from uh, the projects that we're working on. And that's always a, a huge factor um, for us because we're fairly date-driven being an enterprise software company. Yeah. Now, one other thing we found in not every organization, but in some, is that the corporate culture plays into this. So, for example, a uh, you know a small startup that prides themselves on being cutting edge sees risk of tools in a very different way from an older, larger, established company. So, in other words, sometimes the fact that Dita is new and shiny is a feature, and sometimes it's not. Um, depending on the company, did that play in in either case into your you know into the decisions that you're facing? Um, I'm not sure it played so much into our decision, um, but I will talk about corporate culture in a few more slides. Mm -hmm. Okay. Alyssa, I would anything say on your end. Yeah, I would just say for us, um, we're a little more cautious about switching our tools now. We have been in the past. We have switched to tools that um, the transition and then the um, process, once we switched to the tool, we're not very successful. We ran into a lot of problems. So I would say that has made us a little more skeptical of taking on anything new, um, just based on that experience. Mm -hmm. OK. So then what I wanted to do was move on and talk a little bit about uh, the business case or, or lack thereof. So you know, I think, Alyssa, this is, this is really your slide, right? Right. 
So I mentioned most of this before. Um, the migration was going to be overwhelming as far as the tools and the hit it would that we would take on the, our current project work. We don't have the reuse that I would think to make this um, give us the most bang for our buck. Um, we do have the need for the authoring flexibility among various types of documentation based on the types of products that we have. And at the time, uh, the last time that we evaluated it, we did not have any localization. We do have localization now, but as I mentioned, we do use that other process that seems to be working pretty well. And I hate to change something just for the sake of change. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Tony, for you, things look a little bit different, right? Yeah, you know, I, I mentioned a little bit before that 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 we were almost pushed into this. Our, our hands was forced a little bit, and what I mean by that is that um, we were getting a lot of requirements, but it was just it was just clear we weren't going to be able to meet them um, if we kept the status quo. Um, you know, particularly when it came to needing to differentiate content by user role and um, uh, culture, language and culture, and version, and um, viewing device and feature set. You know that's a lot of metadata. And you know, sure, we can technically we can do that additional tags, but it's um, it's very clunky, um, and it requires us to, in theory, it requires us to generate a full set of help topics for every possible combination, which is just not practical. So again, with XML, we can embed all of that you know, rich metadata in there, and we can serve up the XML, and our consuming systems can, can use that XML to do um, basically conditional display or, or dynamic publishing. So um, the, the metadata issue was, was really big for us, as well as being able to support multiple types of, of output. Um, and, you know, and with our particular um, information needs and our, our product architecture, models, uh, we, we just couldn't do it. But, or, and even if we could, I mean, if we did, believe me, we shoehorned RoboHelp into doing a lot of things it wasn't prepared to do, at least in the versions we had. Um, we just we just couldn't keep up because the process was so labor intensive. Okay. So that, I think, brings us to everybody's favorite part of a case study. <laughs> Which is what you know? What what have you learned, or what did you learn, or what uh, I think in the agenda I had this called mistakes were made. But what you know, looking back on this, if you if you're talking to somebody who's at the beginning of this process, trying to make a decision about moving to DITA or not, what kind of advice would you give them, Alyssa? What 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 would you tell people? My biggest thing is is looking at structured content more uh, closely earlier on. That, that's been my biggest lesson. You know, when you haven't done something, you kind of don't know what you're missing sometimes. <laughs> and now that we've moved over to structured uh, authoring, um, it, it's like almost like a whole new, uh, the veil has been lifted kind of thing uh, for me. Because I, I, I knew about structured content. You know, I've learned about it at conferences and talked to people that do it. And, and I know what it is and I know what it, uh, how it helped. But I was like, I just don't see a, a, a need for us. And now that we're doing that, uh, that part of it, it, it really is um, a, a huge benefit in the way that we think about things and the way that we present information. That's probably my biggest uh, lesson learned. What about you, Tony? Yeah, I, I want to hop on that and say, you know, really that reevaluating, you know, as you go is really important, right? We've been working on this initiative for a, a while, and our requirements are still changing. Um, thankfully, they're mostly requiring in, uh, changing in ways that are making the move seem even more logical. <laughs> um, but the other thing, um, a couple other things that I, I mentioned is, um, I mentioned briefly that with the part of an initiative also to move to a content management system eventually. And and I think one of the mistakes we made early on is that we really tried to think about both of those things at the same time immediately um, and, and maybe even work down the content management piece before the data piece. And, and I think if I were going to start over, um, I would separate those two things and move to structure and move to data um, before really, you know, trying to socialize and, and get corporate buy-in for the content management system and those things. Now, having said that, you know, um, the need for content management and for moving to content management certainly is one of the justifications for DITA. Um, but I would just separate those two efforts, um, particularly the business case and 
and kind of political effort around those earlier on. We've done that now, but we learned it, I think, a little bit too late. Um, and then the other thing, I, I would mention something, that it, going back to that question about um, corporate culture. Um, you know, I think at ADP we are, you know, reasonably progressive, but we're also a very large organization and, you know, a little bit conservative about change, right? Things have to be well vetted and, and demonstrated before, before we make, you know, embark on big change. And so, you know, I, I would advocate doing a proof of concept or a demo as early in your process as possible so that you can show both your internal department stakeholders, but also your external, you know, senior management, a partner, stakeholders, that um, on the one hand, you can, you will be able to do what you already do, right? Um, but then you also have to show that you can do this much more or you can do it that much better or that much more efficiently, right? And so the sooner you can do some sort of proof of concept or demo, the better, the easier it is going to be to get that kind of corporate um, buy-in. And then the other thing, just be aware of, is that at least in, in our organization, you know, I think, say, IT senior management and, and other senior management don't really expect innovation um, out of technical publications, right? They're, they're like, well, you know, tech pubs is there, it's fine, you know, what, what do you need a content management system for? What do you need a whole bunch of new tools for? Um, you know, it's just documentation, right? And so you have to realize that, that these people aren't expecting a big proposal <laughs> out of tech pubs for, for, the, for the most part. Um, and so one of the ways we've tried to deal that is, is, is really try to think how we can emphasize not just, you know, efficiency and corporate savings and all of that, but also um, the value to clients, right? How is the end user going to benefit at the end? How is this going to make us, um, differentiate us from our competitors? You know, where is the um, value uh, and not just ROI, but value to clients in this? Um, and the sooner you can kind of figure out a way to, to tell that story, the better. And then I guess the, uh, the, the, the question that goes with that is what, what could happen that would change your decision? Um, what, you know, Tony, what could happen that would cause you to say, you know what, we're not going to do Ditto. We have to do <laughs> something else. Well, perhaps I have my rose-colored glasses on or perhaps I'm past the point of no <laughs> return with this, but um, I feel pretty confident that it would take something really major um, to cause us to change at this point. Now, having said that, we are just finishing up a POC and, and we'll be doing a pilot project, and, and if there is some sort of major fail there, um, we'll have to reevaluate. Um, I suppose the other thing is if we find out with our initial rollout that, you know, the, the, the training you know, and learning curve or the implementation cost um, exceeds our expectations, um, we might have to, to uh, reevaluate. But I, I think it would really have to be um, a really un unexpected, insurmountable, you know, cost or, or time barrier at this point. What about you, Alyssa? You said you are looking at this sort of periodically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do reevaluate re every, I would say probably every couple of years, uh, we take another look and say, okay, do we have enough reuse, do we, you know, localization needs, is that an, an issue? Um, as I mentioned before, I don't think, unless something significantly changes on our localization team, I don't see that being a huge factor. I think probably more reuse within our uh, information development group and um, with other organizations um, in our company would probably be my biggest factor there um, for actually uh, changing the decision. Um, another thing is um, just looking at possibly what uh, the suggestion was earlier about moving forward with only the new content in DITA. If something changed in our legacy doc sets, which we are trying to change now to make them more streamlined, if those change significantly enough that we could go forward with possibly um, being able to write new content in, in DITA and um, leave the rest alone, um, that would probably be a, a secondary factor as well. Okay, so then I guess, the, you know, the question was sort of like, what, if you've decided that you need to change your process in some way, what, what does that push look like? I mean, 
at what point do you decide that you're going to bite the bullet and jump on the, the zip line <laughs> or whatever this is here? Yeah, you know, it, it, it seems like it was kind of a um, not much of a choice. It seems like somebody pushed us off this a little bit. Now, granted, it has taken us a while to, to build up momentum and get things in place to do it. But again, for us, it was really that we were getting uh, requirements about information delivery from product marketing that that we couldn't we couldn't meet with our tool set and with our level of, of sourcing. So, so, you, so your um, platform really was actually crumb So your platform was actually crumbling. <laughs> That's one way to look at it. Yes. <laughs> um, you know it. Um, yeah. You know I I think in Alyssa's case I I think she's really setting herself up well, right? Because what, I guess one of the other things I might have said as a lesson learned is is, you know, rewrite your content before you make the migration, right? Put it into um, a, even if it's not the, you know, literal data XML structure, put it into a structure, you know, give it a minimalist edit, make sure you have, you know, um, content types that match up with data, that kind of thing. Um, and I, I think what's brilliant about, you know, her situation is that she's evaluating things, you know, constantly evaluating against her requirements, but in the meantime, she's also getting the benefit of structure and, you know, if they decide in a few years to move to DITA, um, that conversion will go, you know, that much more simply because A, her writers are used to it, and B, her content's going to be in good shape. So, you know, she won't have to jump, or her zip line won't be as high. <laughs> in yeah, we're, take, we're taking baby steps off our platform. <laughs> <laughs> So that's actually a good point you brought up, Tony, because we have been going through an initiative um, the last year and a half or two years um, in trying to transform some of our legacy documentation into, instead of the giant, um, what I call everything in the kitchen sink uh, way of writing, to really being having more of a minimalist base and more targeted towards what our users really need. So we have that part already going. Um, we do talk a lot about concept procedure reference um, writing as well, even though we don't have that in data or some sort of content management system, you know, the topics labeled certain ways. In our heads, we kind of are already starting that. So should we change to data in the future, you know, we'll have the writing set up. We could do, as Tony mentioned earlier, a, a pilot project with maybe one of our products, one of our documentation sets to kind of start off and see how that goes. Um, we'll already be in the structured frame, you know, the structured authoring that we're doing now. So we, we are kind of taking baby steps. So should we need it in the future, hopefully we'll be set up so it won't be quite as um, big a jump. All right. Well, I think, I think we've killed that metaphor, but, but it was fun. <laughs> Um, okay, I am, I'm going to run through a couple of kind of closing slides and then we're going to take some questions. So for those of you listening on the line, that ought to give you enough time to type in your burning questions. And I do know we have a couple that are waiting on us. So we'll tackle those as we go through. But there are just a couple of things I wanted to run through. One is uh, business cases. If you go to www.contentstrategy101.com, which is the companion site for our new book, we have a number of case studies there which includes sample cost calculations for a variety of process changes in information. Um, what we're finding is that a lot of people um, are having a lot of trouble with the, just the idea of how to construct a business case. So there are some that are out there that you might want to take a look at. Uh, I have to mention the book because it is finally done and it's been a really, really long haul. So if you wander over again to contentstrategy101.com, you can get, uh, there's ordering information there. The EPUB and Kindle are on their way. They're actually not ready, but the print version is out and available at Amazon and various places like that. Um, upcoming, whoops, sorry, upcoming events. Uh, we do have a few things coming up. There's a business case for content strategy and tech comm webcast that I'm doing with Scott Abel and Val Swisher in sort of mid-October. Um, I'm going to be out at LavaCon, and I think, Tony, you're going as well, right? That's right. Yep. So we'll be out there. That's in about two weeks. Um, I'm going out to Germany for TCOM TC World, so if anybody's on the line that's planning to go there, that'd be great. There's more information at scriptorium.com events. And with that, uh, I believe we will move over here and take some questions. So. Um, and I'll let you guys either jump in or, or tell me that I have to answer the question, I suppose. 
Uh, we have an early one um, asking whether a program like FrameMaker is required in order to use DITA. So is a program like FrameMaker required in order to use DITA? Well, Anyone want to? technically the answer is no. Um, technically you can do DITA in a text editor, but I wouldn't advise it. Um, in, in my experience, based on my research, you know, I, I find that the easiest way to do it is um, with an XML editor, um, something in the, um, and, and specifically an XML editor that has DITA specification and DITA open toolkit support. So those will be things like Oxygen or XMetal. Um, you know, you, that there is a way to do DITA with FrameMaker. I'm not very familiar with it. Perhaps um, Tara can jump on that. Um, yeah, so I mean, so the short answer to the question of is FrameMaker, is a program like FrameMaker re required is no. Um, XML, DITA is XML, XML is text, so provided that you have any old text editor, you can author in DITA. Uh, that said, the various DITA editors that you, you know, pay for in varying degrees of large amounts of money, um, may be worth your while because they will allow you to author more efficiently. So the question is whether the cost of something like FrameMaker or Oxygen or any of the rest of them is worth it because it will make you that much more efficient. Uh, the general answer to that is yes, that it, you know, the $500 or $1,000 or $1,200, whatever it may be for the license, is worthwhile because otherwise you're hand coding everything and that's just really not not delightful at all. Um, there's a there's a did a Microsoft Word question here. Um, so we have problems moving to Dita without using Microsoft Word because of the learning curve and program available. Oh, okay. So I think the question here and then there's another one later is Essentially, what this person is saying is somewhere in their workflow they have to provide Word files. And so moving to DITA is interesting, but if you also have to provide Word files, you know, how do you then get to DITA with or without Word? Um, I have some thoughts on this, but do either one of you want to tackle that one? This, this actually hasn't been a big requirement for us, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you tackle it. <laughs> And okay. Since I don't do data, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Good answer. Great. Well, that leaves me. Um, okay, so the, the requirement here is we have to supply Microsoft Word so non-professionals can translate our documents into several, probably several languages. It says questions, but I think into several languages. So it is possible to have data content and output it to Microsoft Word and then use that Microsoft Word output to do what you know whatever you need to do with it downstream um, that said I would be seriously concerned about a workflow that involves authoring in DITA uh, there's no polite way to say this but they're authoring in DITA dumbing it down to Microsoft Word and then sending it to um, translators that are not you know professional translators and oh yes I see some of our um, some of our some of our localization people that are on the call are um, having heart attacks. So to quote one of them, that would prevent reuse, translation, memory building, etc. So in other words, it may look inexpensive to do it that way, but in the long run, it might actually be quite expensive. So I would actually go back and question the requirement to deliver Word files and look at the question of whether that can be addressed. But to answer it from a technical point of view, yes, it can be done. And there, is a, there are a variety of ways that you could do that. Um, OK. Let's see here. Um, oh, here's an interesting question here. And Tony, I think I'll throw this one at you. Uh, does using DITA, uh, this, is part, there, this is sort of a two-part question. So does using DITA build the writer's expertise from authoring to delivering the output? Or does it create a dependency on having gurus who would be responsible for generating the multiple outputs? And a side note, option two does not offer writer growth and can create resistance. Wow, that, that's a great question. Um, I think that one of 
and, and it, it's a matter of perspective, really, about, <laughs> um, you know, particularly when we get to the question of, you know, say, career growth. Um, one of the kind of selling points um, that, that can be made for uh, DITA, and in fact for most structured offering approaches, um, is that they separate authoring from publishing, right? So in a way, this frees up authors to author, right? Um, in fact, just this week, I got feedback from one of our writing teams about how we're spending way too much time doing formatting. It's really frustrating. We need more time to write. Um, that's, you know, that's our primary focus. Um, and so a lot of people see that as a good thing. You know, for the most part, um, authors will have less to do with publishing. Um, and so, uh, again, you know, whether you see that as a good thing or a bad thing, you know, in relation to your own career is, is a personal thing. Um, it, it does mean that, yeah, there are some people who are going to be more involved with creating the plugins and the transforms and those things that they create the specific outputs that are needed. Um, in my experience, this isn't a whole lot different than the way it is now. Um, while our authors can publish documents, for the most part, there's usually one person on a team, or there might be one person that, that does publishing for a couple teams. So, you know, in my experience, in most cases, there's somebody who, you know, is a little more techie or is a little more interested in techie stuff or is a little more interested in design stuff that does that. And so, you know, one way to look at it is, yeah, um, it removes that responsibility from authors, and that's a good thing. You know, another thing is, oh, I'm kind of interested in that. Now will I no longer be able to do that? And I would say probably not. Again, it depends on your corporate culture and your structure. But um, you could also look at it as an opportunity that if you are interested in that, you could be one of those those pub people. The other thing I would say is that publication is going to get much more simple once it's set up, right? So there's some initial work that has to be done to create those transforms. Um, and, and that can be pretty technical. In fact, for our first ones, um, we're probably going to have consultants do it, right? We're not even going to do it in-house. But the, the beauty of it is that once that's set up, publishing becomes push button, right? So that, um, you know, we have our transforms and our plugins set up, and, and we just say which ones we want generated, and, and off it goes. So um, again, you know, how this plays into career aspirations and those kinds of things, so it's, really going to depend on um, how your particular organization handles this. Alyssa, did you want to jump in on this? I've got a couple of things to say. <laughs> now you go right ahead. <laughs> OK. So um, I actually think this is, an, this is a good example of a case where this is not, this is not really a data specific problem. This is actually an XML publishing issue. So XML, in general, is, is challenging to publish from. And XML, in general, moves you from what we've had, this sort of desktop publishing paradigm where you set up templates and then people kind of follow the templates, you hope. But sometimes they override them, and sometimes they do custom things, and sometimes they do stuff. Uh, over in XML and structured authoring land, the template is sort of ruthlessly enforced. And a lot more work goes into building those upfront enforcement templates, and a lot more work goes into the back-end automatic publishing. So the trade-off is that you push a button and you get published, but you have to write valid files, you have to validate them, and you have to write these transformations or these very complex templates that push out the information. So. Um, so I do think that there is actually a, a growing gap between a writer role and a publisher, transformation builder, programmer, whatever you want to call that person, uh, where in desktop publishing land, it's, it's reasonably possible for the author to also be a publishing expert. I don't think an author, a good technical writer, can also be a publishing expert. It's sort of a, you have to pick one or the other as the specialty because it takes so much time. So in other words, the, the technical requirements of doing transformations are so significant that you really have to spend a lot of time being to be an expert in that. You can't just do it on the side as a writer. So there is a, a, a differentiation there. Um, now in terms of dependency, uh, well, depend <laughs> Dependency on gurus, uh, we've always had dependency on, you know, the template person. 
but there's always been the thought of, oh, I could be the template person if I just, you know, spend a little more time on it. Um, writer growth, um, I guess I would argue that writer growth is going to be in other areas. It's not going to be in building these transforms. Um, if you go back and look at 1995 or thereabouts when HTML first came out, for a while, knowing how to hand code HTML was a big deal. And now it's just sort of this thing that everybody knows how to do. But we're not all CSS3 experts, because that's just not a useful thing to do. We pretty much just follow the template. I think this is going to take very much that a similar kind of um, approach. Hey, so. Sarah, I will jump in mm -hmm. here. Um, <laughs> While we don't do ditto, we do uh, the process that we do use in-house. We have people dedicated to working on things like templates and building that uh, back end so that process will work. They, they don't write documentation. We have the writers that write the documentation, and then we have what we call them production specialists that um, work on the actual uh, back end side of things. So it does take a lot of time, like you mentioned. Yeah, and well, I think it's, like it's what, tough what you're saying is there is opportunity for career growth it may just mean changing your career <laughs> right? Um, from, from writing to, to this other thing. Um, so I wanted to jump on this with a, with a follow-up question. Um, you know, that, you know they're, they're publishing um, in, in the sense of you know, generating outputs for things you already have configured, right? But then there's this really technical part you were talking about, you know, setting up um, you know, the DTDs and the transforms and, and all of this other stuff. Um, that's really technical. Um, do you think that, um, I know for example, when we start, we're going to use consultants to do that, right? Because we don't have that in-house expertise. It's very technical. We want to get going relatively quickly. Um, but I'm wondering if there's kind of a um, decision point or a point of critical mass there where um, it becomes necessary to have a person in-house or you know, particularly for smaller implementations, does it make sense to to have consultants do that kind of configuration setup work on an ongoing? Well, day? we've. Um, I'd really like to hide be behind. I'm the moderator, <laughs> 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 but I guess that would be cheating. Okay, so we have seen everything, every possible, uh, you know, I possibility on the continuum from a one-person shop where the person in that organization has built his or her own stuff just from the ground up and was, you know, technical enough and interested enough to go in and do those kinds of things, to uh, a situation where somebody uses, let's say, the Ditto Open Toolkit or the DocBook um, publishing environment, which is actually quite fully featured, and then has just tweaked that around the edges. But basically, everything done in-house by you know somebody who also writes on the side in very small organizations. In very large organizations, when you start looking at an IBM um, or a Cisco or uh, a NetApp, then what you're going to see is that they have a tools team in-house whose job it is to provide tools for the information development or tech pubs organization. So they have in-house people that, that do this and have a centralized function for it. And then in between, you have you know everybody else. And there, what we're seeing is that it's very common for people to send us style sheets and ask us to write transforms for them because they don't want to do them in-house. Um, what then tends to happen is one of two things. Either they contract with, with us or with somebody like us to maintain those style sheets over time. So we have a number of customers that come to us and say, hey, can you update this? Hey, we changed our corporate color. Hey, we changed this. Hey, we changed that. Can you make those fixes? The other approach is to have us create the initial style sheet, but then when we're done, we turn them over and we do a bunch of training, and then there are people inside that take over. And I don't have any sense of what the breakdown is in terms of who handles things which way or what the percentages are, but it is everything from a black box, you know, I don't even want to know what you're doing, just send me a style sheet so I can push, push a button, to I want to do it all myself. And every possible combination in between. I, I think I've forgotten the one where people plug along, um, you know, asking help for help on the DITA users group trying to get information about how to do stuff. It is all over the place. 
Um, and I don't think there's a single best practice. It comes back again to corporate culture. You know, what's the best fit for your environment and your company size and all the rest of it? So, okay, so did either one of you want to have anything else that you wanted to tell the people, final words of wisdom that you want to leave them with? Um, I don't really have anything except, you know, patience is a virtue. <laughs> <laughs> That's whether you're doing data or not. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> Well, that is certainly true. How about you, Melissa? Uh, no, probably my biggest words of wisdom would be whether you're doing it or not, just make sure that you reevaluate every so often because uh, requirements change and, and needs change as well. So um, the industry changes and, and what your company is doing changes. So especially if you're not doing DITA, you know, just making sure that you, you keep up with what is going on and make really make sure that it, it's what is right for you. Um, it doesn't change over time. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, thank you both. Um, I, I appreciate you coming and, you know, hanging out here and sharing some of your wisdom, your hard-earned wisdom on this. Um, and thank you to everybody for coming and, and attending this one. If you have further questions, um, send them my way and I will send, I will forward them on. And, or I think, I believe that you can ping both uh, Alyssa and Tony on Twitter if you need to. So thank you, everybody. And Thank we will you. see you on. Thanks, guys. We'll see Thanks you on the so next much. one. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.